All right, uh, welcome to KCP Community Meeting, August 17th, 2021. Uh, we have a few small items on the agenda, nothing, uh, well, no, no, dis no discussion topics yet, but we'll see where we end up. Um, I wanted to surface that David, uh, David is on uh, PTO right now, but right before he left, he made a lot of progress on the rebasing of the Kubernetes fork on top of 122. Um, it's a lot cleaner now and a lot less far behind. Um, it's only like this many commits, which isn't too bad. It was it was much worse and in much worse shape before. So I think uh, when he gets back, we will. Uh, he's going to prioritize getting that like merged and updated and have everything um, in the KCP repo depend on that. Uh, but that is great progress on that. If you are interested in that, or uh, I've had a couple of people ask, what is it that we're proposing making changes to in Kubernetes? And that is a much better answer than the answer we had before, which was a lot of stuff based on 118. So um, that's very exciting. Uh, this is my public recorded documented uh, promise to write a design doc for the multi-cluster scheduling stuff that we have been discussing in, in um, well, in some in this uh, meeting venue and some in other venues, uh, I think we are circling closer and closer towards something we think will work. Uh, but in order to validate that, I need to write that down, have people uh, poke holes in it or or identify um, uh, missing cases or things that might not scale like you would want. Uh, that includes the how we will schedule things to multiple clusters, how the syncer will see those things being scheduled to the cluster and make them manifest on the re on the cluster, on the physical cluster. And, and in some cases, how it will report state back up to KCP to make other scheduling and, and uh, syncing decisions. Things like uh, we'll create a service on one physical cluster and it needs to report the services IP to KCP to have it propagated to other clusters so they can talk to it. Um, that sort of foundational groundwork that's necessary for a lot of multi-cluster stuff when things are scheduled across clusters and not just scheduled to a single of the available clusters. Um, like I said, we've talked about that a little bit here, but I need to put it in a better, more easily digestible format than my brain or meeting recordings uh, or vague hints at how we think this will work. Um, yeah, and, and so what's your um, what's your mindset there, Jason? You want to get like the basics of the doc written up and do like the quick prototype, or how do you plan on um, how do you plan on kind of showing or trying the deeper stuff once you get like the, like how far does do you think the doc has to go before you're you think it's uh, my, yeah my my goal on the doc is to have something that people can conceptually understand uh, for two reasons. Uh, uh, one is pure bus factor. Like, I don't want this information to only exist in my head and I guess in, and in Clayton's head. Uh, if um, uh, if I disappear off the face of the earth, we wouldn't want to start up, start from scratch. So a design doc is a good place for that. And also to, like, we think this is a good model for this, uh, but we, and we should obviously, yeah, exa and I'm not, I'm not going to get hit by a bus. I'm going to uh, get paid hundreds of millions of dollars to leave. Um, the, uh, uh, was I going to say? Oh, oh, to give people's feedback early before we invest too much in prototyping it, if we can get uh, more eyes on the ideas, yeah, uh, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't uh, block prototyping. We can prototype uh, while we think that's the way to go, but I want to make sure that we have that publicly documented as like this is yeah. the route we're going to go. And I was going to say like um, one of the things I've been going and doing, um, which will be good to have the doc so I can add some song, is like to highlight the conceptual differences between previous approaches and like mm. trying this different. So like an example, like I'm looking at and, you know, contrasting like Karmada's approach, QFED v2, QFED v1, like want to get some of that. Um, there's a couple of other efforts that I'm aware of. It'd be good to have the uh, trying ideas in different directions point to uh, do pros and cons. So I'll, I'll certainly contribute and help with that as we go. Another element, Jason, that I wanted, I was thinking about this, <laughs> We're still, you know, kind of like as we've been like back and forthing and trying to get some of this down into concrete form so that we could then, you know, talk about the examples and then put them in. One of them would be uh, what are the use cases for something that's like there's the transparent multi cluster sitting on top of something that kind of does a little bit of 
placement scheduling, probably two separable pieces. And then there's the sinker, which is effectively more of a generic controller, which is trying to apply, you know, a set of policy to it. So that picture is useful. It actually got me thinking, um, one of the things we had discussed is what happens when you want to take an existing cube object and then do something that's actually uh, uh, multi-cluster aware in a more meaningful way. So there was actually a couple of examples where I was like, oh, you know, like that's a, what, where, what happens when you have a coordination points that are more sophisticated mm -hmm. than the simple, the simple coordination points that we'll have in the design. That'll actually be great to have the simple one written up so you can foil it with, and then, you know, does this fit in? So I, I think it's a, yeah. Uh, it makes total sense to me to focus on that right now. Um, I'm trying to do the same thing for policy, although I think policy is a little bit further behind. Um, one of the, uh, it sounds like what you're saying is one of, one of the things that we that the design doc needs to focus on is how controllers will work without being modified. How like how you could install Argo on a logical cluster and have it just work. But then the next step is. But if you wanted to provide a multi-cluster Argo or a multi-cluster K-native or a multi-cluster aware controller for these things, here's how you would do it. Here's where you would hook in. What is the, yeah, what's the conceptual framework for transparent multi-cluster for controllers? Mm -hmm. And then what's the conceptual framework that would make, uh, 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 what's, not, what's the opposite of transparent? <laughs> Opaque, unfortunately. But but it's is actually, yeah, what's the dual of it? Uh, uh, High touch. Uh, Multi-cluster multi aware controllers. Yeah, yeah. What that's would, what and that was supposed to be like, we had that on our um, diagram of like, explore A, then B, then C, that's on the after we get enough of the transparent example. It, it would be very useful. That's that's kind of what I meant like a, I want to add a new type, which is a, um, like I have transparent de deployments. We decided to say like, let's cut daemon set as a daemon set doesn't make sense to propagate in the mm -hmm. same way. Um, and then so okay, like what would a uh, location aware daemon set look like? Oh well, um, you actually want it to have strategies of how to roll out potentially across multiple locations. Um, we have some examples, so it, it kind of like teases us up to say, would that be something that someone could contribute to the sinker? Would you have to fork the sinker to get that, or would you be able to create another control? And, and Kubelet has a lot of these like problems, which is the way that Kubelet works is it's an API server and a controller. And then there's a whole bunch of sidecar controllers that run on the node for like um, SDN or CNI plugin or CSI plugins that lack a conceptual framework that allows any kind of efficiency. So, yeah. you know, nodes aren't resilient to disconnection from the API server because even if we make Kubelet resilient, all those other controllers would break and then CNI wouldn't work or something like that. So right. it, it was actually really useful to me because I was like, oh, great. Once we have described this, we can say what it doesn't do and then tee that up as topics for investigation. Yeah, uh, so your example was the location aware daemon set, which I think is even a different issue than what I was talking about. One is, I mean, we need to do both. One is, uh, how do I write a multi-cluster aware controller for existing non-multi-cluster aware types, like a yeah, pipeline or a Knative service? How would I say, here's a, here's, yeah. A special controller that knows what to do with those in a multi-cluster environment. The other one is a multi-cluster aware type, which assumes and requires a multi-cluster aware controller. Or assumes the right. presence of the scheduler, because that gets into stuff like bin packing and mm -hmm. like what if you wanted to write a controller that lets you bin pack um, instances of databases onto location clusters? What what would overlap with that? Um, someone else came up with another example, which was really exciting. Knative is the kind of the canonical one for, I don't really want to care which cluster mm -hmm. my Knative function runs on. I just needed to have access to the right things. Um, but then there was another one where someone was like, well, um, if the location concept is described, I can start then comparing it to other things that might have location that might need resource aware scheduling. but do they have to build the whole stack over again? So that's um, another kind of controller that gets easier because part of the problem that the controller is dealing with is a common problem mm -hmm. um, that currently, like cube, any, any problem that is scheduling pods, cube helps you with. Any problem that is not scheduling pods, cube does not help you with. Um, most cube clusters just end up scheduling pods, but it means everything then becomes a pod. What happens when you actually don't care about the pods, you care about the scheduling, so. Right. And again, like having the doc would be great because then we can put the teasers in. So, 
Yeah, I think I think we we have a runway of stuff that I think is going to be non-controversial for for like we can start building, you know, building some of this out. But I think some of the later on stuff will become not controversial, but we'll need more feedback um, from people that would be interested in writing a multi-cluster aware controller or a multi-cluster aware type. Uh, I think we can conceptualize what those are, but we want someone who's actually going to have to write that to have some feedback on that. So. That is my that is my solemn promise to you. I am uh, I am off next Wednesday until September seventh, so we'll I'm have off, a meeting next week. And... I'm off next Wednesday as well. Oh, okay. Week. So um, okay, I, David will be back next week. Or I think weeks. so. Yeah. Uh, so my hope is to get this design doc in in you know something that we can share and start talking about, but then uh, I will give you all two weeks without me to think it over. And then when I come back, you can deluge me with, with all the uh, comments and, and problems with it. But um, so I think we'll have a meeting next week and not the next two weeks, unless you all want to have a meeting. Yeah, I, you know, you don't need me to have these things. So uh, if you want to have one or whatever, uh, you absolutely can, but. Um, uh, I was going to add, um, so I had two yeah. quick summary ones. Um, so I spent some time with Jessica well, nice. um, just brainstorming um, and, uh, a few people have seen this. I'm trying to, I got the basic policy PR and then I generated like 700 questions in a list with Jessica and I'm trying to like figure out which of those questions would come back in. So this is the, um, if a logical cluster is a net new concept that, you know, either we have in uh, KCP or goes into core cube or whatever, what are the series of things that could use that? And so one of them was um, if you can make tenancy hard tenancy, a fundamental thing, how much work does that take away from operations teams and platform integrators and extension builders where they can say, you know what, I can't do API type tenancy today, so I gotta go invent all my own solutions or I tie it to the cluster. Um, I can't do really hard tenancy between workloads on a single cluster, so I have to give everybody multiple clusters. Um, I, there's no constructs built into cube that really make uh, tenancy of organizational concepts work well. Like you can build them on top of namespaces, but then you still hit the limitations of namespaces. Logical clusters would be, okay, we'll take both of those, flip it around. A logical cluster is the unit of all tenancy. Um, and there are hard boundaries between it. How would you accomplish those? I got like a long, long list. Um, most of them come down to some form of what are kind of the problems that we're aware of that large deployers of cube in tenant environments have. Um, what are some of the things like from the uh, you know generated by SIG multi-cluster and SIG multi-tenancy over the years? Um, what are some emerging patterns on cloud providers? Like what are the ana analogs to cloud? Uh, can we articulate a better model? So we've got a bunch of questions. Um, I think we're starting to circle around. We could see like three models, like a simple model which is the kind of cube out of the box YOLO, like have fun, build it yourself. Logical clusters are a tool. Um, here's how you could compose them as simple as possible to get some measure of tenancy for your org. Um, and that's it. There's a next level up, which would be more of the, um, you want to do organizational sub tenancy where you'd say like, yeah, I want to come in and be able to set, say that a group of people have this much quota by default. And then they can use it to consume. And then when they hit a limit, an organizational admin can come in and add more. So things that are pretty familiar in most existing systems like vSphere or even the cloud providers. Then there's the third one, which is probably what I would call true hard policy, uh, hard tenancy policy, which is you expect to have multiple competing subtenants that themselves are hard isolated. And this is something Cube's never really been able to provide in a single cluster. The mindset here would be, could you offer a primitive and a relative pattern that's good enough so that you actually could get that super hard tenancy boundary between two uh, full hard tenants? So you could have organization and organization B and be relatively guaranteed that they are hard separated on policy, uh, resource constraints, et cetera, and you can manage this. So you could run a service that says, I have mm -hmm. competing initiatives. And I see this within large organizations. Um, you know, certainly there's people out there who would want to use this for their own services or if they were building um, if they were building a service that they were offering to internal teams or as um, a customer thing. So they think about um, people offering any kind of hardware resources for sale. Um, what could we catalyze there? Could we make something that's um, 
can we get some ideas in place that seem useful enough that people could tweak or take them and, and actually build full production services that have hard tenancy isolation and the right sharding characteristics, et cetera. You could run a, yeah. you could run a customer facing service and sell to individual tenants. Um, so that'd be like three levels. And then the third yeah. level is like, we'd want to have a demonstration model because I think, you know, from a Red Hat perspective, we would plan on, that would be what our goal is, but then you'd be able to take pieces of that and bring it into the other two, the, the, the medium complex ones. So you can do organizational policy and the simple ones, so you can build something out of the box. Um, probably going to try to come up with a couple of example API objects, a couple of example patterns, um, it's kind of come down to like, if you want to make everything that you do cube control applicable, could you use that for the policy itself? Because you want to say things like, I want to set a quota for an organizational team um, at a very high level. Um, what if I want to set quota on individual resources? What are the concepts out there that are missing? So those are kind of the yeah. three layers of the policy discussion right now. So Clayton, I might be playing catch up here. And if there's better resources that I need to go uh, dig into, then just point me in the right direction. When, you, when we talk about policy here, are we talking about inventing a new language of policy or are we talking about supporting no. the existing constructs like network policy? No, uh, I'm not talking about like, either of those actually. We're talking about a meta system for um, how would you extend a tenanted cube system to add your own policy constructs so that you could do organizational sub policy at a generic level. So this would be something like, um, how would you reproduce the AWS account system in an open source fashion built around a cube like control plane and still get um, still get hard tenancy like you do when you have like you could have a back plane that sits in there. Again, these are the three levels of it, which is sure. First level is YOLO like cube today. Second level is I want to split up my org and have reasonable soft boundaries. And then there's the I want to be able to do super hard boundaries and I don't want to have to come back later on and be like, oh, we missed a really fundamental property of hard tenancy. Like um, the, you know, you should be able to create things that the creator does not have access to because of organizational policy. Um, this is like the thing that APIs would fit into for doing organizational policy or resource policy or whatever. So it's not the, those systems, it's the system that enables those. So we had the discussion around placement behavior and work distribution for open cluster management. There's also a policy layer also focused on multi-cluster policy, both distribution, compliance, enforcement. Those are all below and, this layer. Yeah, this, this, and, those and, are and that I think it, that makes sense. And I think I'm kind of poking at what it does. It make sense to review those in this forum to look at some machinery that might help support what's needed underneath the, the meta policy layer. Yeah, the meta policy layer would be more explicitly something like um, how do you get a spot where you could create those policies? So there's the idea that there'd be policies that control that. I'm not even talking about necessarily all those, but like sketching out a couple of examples. Um, and it's not actually about the mechanism, like the assumption being that you could write controllers or have a plugin system. Even that's not really the first question. It would be like from first principles, if you had a control plane and you wanted that control plane to be internally consistent and be able to use controller like tools and policy being applied what would that look like so i think that's relevant what you're describing michael um mm -hmm. i don't i think it's the it's the step up from that um i'll uh, i'll show you the work in progress doc that jessica and i were just drafting in last week okay sure this is like this is definitely trying to hit the meta question and then come back to those and be like, could you, if, for example, within an organization, create a resource that a controller materializes across a lot of resources, across a lot of logical clusters to do policy. So it, sure. it's, how would you write a controller that deals with organizational concepts? And then how would you have controllers that are orthogonal to organizational concepts? but still have a tenancy component. So like an example would be, how do you expose an API? Like think about GCP or AWS. There are APIs that are not exposed to you as a tenant. Your org admin goes and enables those by virtue of potentially the billing relationship. Once you've enabled that API, then someone can use it. So that system, um, it's, it's adjacent to what you're describing. And I think having some mm -hmm. examples of those to contrast will be very useful. Okay. And then when you, when we use policy in this forum, certainly anyone 
from the broader community that looks at this is probably going to pop the question, how does this compare to open policy agent, right? Defining open policies with Rego as admission controllers with the way that gatekeepers realized open policies and Kubernetes. I recognize that there is a difference in terms of what you're describing, because part of what you're describing maybe is not so much about using the word policy to describe it, but what is the access uh, control model? What's the scoping yeah. model for how you do a concept What's the like account? Model? I, I think that it, yeah. it is about how do you, um, there's a fundamental unit of container that you have to, today is only you boot a cube cluster. That is the only, yep. that is the only container that's larger than namespace. Effectively by saying, what's the analog to namespaces for clusters where you don't have to instantiate an implementation to get a cluster, um, but you can use many of the same constructs. Uh, what are the patterns that would make sense there? And they look a lot like, you know, what are the analogs to cloud, right? Because at some level, um, the, the reason why AWS has accounts and GCP has hierarchical projects with hierarchical quota is both of them made trade-offs based on their internal systems. Sure. Design yeah. point. What's a what's a meta organizational container concept that would work really well for the most number of people that draws from those experiences? Things like OPA, I do think have a spot. Um, what I would probably say is um, thinking of OPA. Well, something like OPA is focused on enforcing desired behavior or validation from an organization, but it's orthogonal to the concept of access control or scope management. Scope management within an organization. organization. Yeah, and and it might be that policies, like I think about this as like, what is a controller, what is a webhook, and what is a, uh, what is a uh, policy engine? Uh, those are all blurry lines, right? You can have a webhook driven by a controller, um, where you know the controller reads some inputs and outputs. You know, control a control loop can record its sure. decisions in a way that um, could, a control loop could calculate a an OPA policy doc or something for a webhook to use. So we probably want to stay on the um, what are the things that a general policy engine could plug into, and how would it plug in is a key part of this. So your your point before about examples from OCM or whatever I think is relevant of. Uh, you might have a policy engine that you want to consult for some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. That is a just as reasonable an integration point as a mechanism that's in process. Um, so it would be, um, you know, kind of like all self-service systems uh, have some similarities and then vast differences. At least if you're using um, ServiceNow for a uh, for a process management system or a policy management system with ticketing and all that. Um, there's elements of that that could feed into other systems. We'd want to be relatively flexible to the type of policy that can be applied. And that maybe that's the three layers I was kind of describing is like you could hook it, you could plug it in, or you could build APIs around it. I think I'm most interested in are there APIs that feel sufficiently general, even looking at them today, so that you get some of that someone's already done this, I'll just plug my stuff into it. And OPA and other webhooks, uh, controllers that work today, if those are familiar enough, you'd be like, oh, well, I could see how I could integrate my existing policy story. Like I want a uh, quota. The example, sure. a couple of people have done like cluster resource quota, which is for a set of namespaces do quota. Uh, quota is kind of a generalizable pattern. Would it be reasonable to say, like, well, then why wouldn't I have an organizational level quota or something like that? Could I extend those existing patterns familiar? Sure. Could I plug OPA in and have OPA make decisions for me? Yes. And could I gut the implementation and replace it with my own backed by whatever? Yes. So kind of the three, um, the same approaches that we've taken for Cube and for um, uh, minimal API servers. Like, how could someone build their own? What could we provide? What, what is a batteries included, modern sure. cloud aware, cube in cube informed and enterprise use case aligned uh, organizational containment unit for any unit of work? Because like so, there is an aspiration for KCP to be generic control plane for anything. So think I'm with you there. When you start talking about the scope uh, control mechanisms or isolation or, or meta containment model. You needed a way. You need a way to formally identify in a unique form um, some set of objects that you intend to contain. 
so is it already within has it already been kind of worked out how you would drive that naming so if you look at you know again you're going back to aws and gcp and other examples um, prior art something like a cloud resource name or an aws resource name where you have a definitive pattern that says here's how i uniquely identify not only um, available services that add behavior so i think that's sort of the the service provider behavior that you're trying to articulate where I'm plugging in something that's not quite KCP, but is doing something related to KCP and it's sort of plugging in at the side, but I still wanna be able to describe the access control model. An example there might be, I've got a cloud service offering me Kafka instances, um, topic SKUs, other related objects. I'm gonna provision those, I'm gonna create a KCP API object and it's fulfillment ultimately results in creating instances in a cloud service that are now part of my scope or access control. But I need a way to identify those objects. And so that Kafka service needs a way to onboard. Here is how I identify instances in my service. Or if I've got a cluster, here's how KCP identifies uniquely, not only clusters, but namespaces or other objects within the cluster. And so that concept of like a cloud resource name seems to come up because ultimately as you talk about these types of policies you're also talking about really um RBAC, right you're doing role-based access control at some level you're going to define a concept of tenancy that that evolves from who has the power of the purse to pay for it right there's a billing construct at the very root down to how i subdivide who has authority to create destroy or, or generate billable resource down to maybe individual consumers that are simply getting the benefit of that set of resources. And in that type of hierarchical model where you extend from billing to organizational structure to consumer, the objects that you want to associate have to be identifiable. So as we think about this sort of meta policy containment model, I think you also end up having to create some equivalent form of or standard for how uh, KCP defines cloud resource names and how orthogonal services that are provisioned that aren't Kubernetes things that are related to these KCP apps would also say declare to this general purpose access control system. Here are objects that I want to denote as part of my contained scope or part of this consumer's contained scope or this organization's contained scope or this root billing contained scope? Yeah, I think I think elements of that are, are definitely reasonable. The relationship between um, what are the what are the fundamental concepts? You know, almost everyone does charge charge back of some form or they have a system where they wish they had charge. Mm -hmm. um, the what are the overlaps? Is there is there a pattern that's reasonably broad enough? So like tying a containment unit to cost is a fundamental thing. Who has authority to change that? that gets into you know, each of the three levels, right? I just want to be able to put a label on this container that says who's the, the billing unit. Then you want to change who can control it. Then you actually have to do much more rigorous things, which is that the active change has to be audited or accepted. So those are the kind of like the three levels of um, Cube kind of started from the assumption that we believe that we could offer level one, which is um, provide labels on namespaces, which is sufficient to um, solve all problems, or you can build a solution for some of those problems on top. And then we left uh, two and three as an exercise for readers. And actually one of my, one of my inputs coming back into this is that actually it wasn't sufficient um, to do that in cube. And given the benefit of history, um, we need to think about layers one, two, and three, and probably have a couple of examples, tie those to the existing systems that are out there, like the cloud systems, and then say, make a decision at that point how far do we go? Like your, your idea of names. It's possible that one or more of the aspects of authorization or authentication actually disappears behind the system. And that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. like, we guessed in cube that we could put, make names opaque, and we mostly have gotten away with it in our back. Um, our back's a fundamental part of cube. If someone tried to use the KCP like things, would they expect our back to work? My gut is yes. And so might treat our back as an axiom and say, you know, we're going to have late we want to have labels on everything that's a cube like thing our back is part of clusters already we're not going to take that away because then you have to invent a new system 
but that might then I, I i think you're right michael that'll almost certainly interact with how would you reference yeah. a logical cluster within a larger set in a way that an orthogonal system could reference it um, maybe we can leave that under the covers but having a pattern or discussing the topic and saying like this is an exercise left for the reader because we have evidence that it would work or conversely we recommend this scheme because it's actually the scheme we're already using in these areas and it's practical yeah and i think if you try to drive labeling as the identification scheme for objects that are uh, within a certain access control scope now labels have to be more tightly controlled um, by administrators who have permissions to create and assign them if arbitrary users can create and assign labels they might you might open up attack vectors for inadvertently adding or removing an object from a protected group and and i think the difference here that we have as an advantage that we did not have before in cube is an inside cube everything is inside the system uh, but mm -hmm. i think we have an opportunity to use the logical cl cluster construct because APIs are exposed into a logical cluster. You do not just get all APIs, which means you can have APIs that modify the system that are not inside all logical clusters, which means you can actually define a model where the inputs and the, like looking at a logical cluster, every logical cluster is a beautiful and unique snowflake from the inside. From the outside, you can de detail hom homogeneity but the assumption that like inside of a logical cluster, there is a logical cluster resource that you can change is actually very handily completely absent, which means there is no way from inside a workspace to change that. The APIs that allow you to change it outside are where you can spend the time. Um, sure. and, and this actually gets into things that we talked about early on, we haven't talked about in a while, but like virtualization of cube core resources through things like aggregated APIs, you can do read-only layers that are very effective. Once you start getting into like um, deletes, things get a little bit more hairy. But what you can do is you could certainly, we could actually talk about how you could virtualize and expose. Because like, again, like so great example here is if you have enough people, eventually you're going to want, here's the list of the things I have access to. That is not something Cube ever did by default. It requires, um, you know, you have to build a certain trade-offs. Would you want that list though to be queryable? You need to make it queryable for the purposes of controllers working across multiple logical clusters and list watchable so that you can build controllers on it. And that's another axiom, right? Like the assumption is anything we do here is controllable or somebody can go build a completely opaque system. I'd probably say, since we want to solve the multi-logical cluster controller problem, the way that we solve the, how do you get a list of the workspaces you access to, or the list of logical clusters you have access to so that you can perform a list, that API will be really important and should emerge from the policy stuff. You don't have to, you could implement a open API based, you know, file based, you know, database based, whatever story for how you get logical clusters. I think all that's within the realm of possibility, but the best part would be we probably actually can combine the idea of, you know, logical, each logical cluster can have its own APIs with the fact that APIs don't have to be implemented in cube mm -hmm. and can be virtualized to like, you know, say you've got a system of record like AWS, would it be possible to say, here's the accounts you have access to delegate that call, expose it in a cube like fashion. It might be, we'd want to think through that as we're going, but yeah. the, it should be possible to set up a, a and I'm saying KCP is a stand-in for it. You should be able to set up a server that can run instances that can get you logical clusters just because you want to have something useful out of the box. Trying to get that out of the box so that it feels cube-like, it offers those same controls you're talking about, Michael, and it has the nice separation. I think that's like our secret weapon is because we can bring different APIs, we actually could do things like, oh, this is the organizational policy logical cluster. In here, yeah. you get a set of APIs, like one of the objects is a new logical cluster. One of the objects is um, access control lists. Uh, one of them is an RBAC system. One of them is OPA webhooks. But when someone goes and tries to create a logical cluster, we separate that from the actual system that provides it. Like I could go to a logical cluster that's a virtual one where I ask for self-service, like here's my logical clusters by my username or something. So the the logical cluster tool i want to abuse as much as possible so that i can cube control apply all layers of policy 
but different people will see different ones of those we can use some of that. so okay. this is like we're trying to summarize the key strategic opportunities axioms was part of what i had just started on um and i'll i'll, I'll definitely share some stuff with you anybody else who's interested you know ping me in the slack channel i'm I'm mostly just trying to iterate enough to get some ideas down. Um, and it's more of like the, based on what we know already, what can we guide on? So it's a very long okay. way of saying it's very early, Michael. No, 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 and that that's fair. I, I, I appreciate we're still trying to get some of the concepts. I do have kind of a, a practical, concrete question uh, for desired outcome. Do we believe that it is, and I guess we, um, is there a relatively formed uh, consensus around the intersection of tenancy and cluster? When, one of the conversations that we talked about, I think before when we talked about placement and logical, the distribution of configuration and work and open cluster management has this model of a, an agent connected to a hub and you've got one agent, the, the agent's always connected to one hub and a hub can have many agents. We talked about the not necessarily multi cluster, but multi context and the ability to have a KCP server distribute work to one to N clusters, but also one to N clusters accepting work from one to N KCP servers. And then you get into this uh, in this N by N, M by N configuration, perhaps. In that model, it makes sense to me that if I have a, a KCP server, if I have, let's say, um, the, the tendency model, I've got a Coke KCP server and a Pepsi KCP server. And if the Coke KCP server is bound to two dedicated clusters and the Pepsi KCP server is bound to two dedicated clusters, then I can see a model that says, look, I have really strict tenancy boundaries. Coke can Coop apply cluster rules and CRDs. And these two clusters that make up the Coke tenant will you know, presumably accept the cluster rules, accept the CRDs. The Pepsi KCP server can do the same with the, the dedicated clusters behind it. But if I have an M by N model where Coke and Pepsi look like distinct tenants, but are articulating resource across, you know, four shared clusters as opposed to de two dedicated, one to each tenant, I don't know comprehend a way that the current model of Kubernetes would allow them to do really strict tenancy behavior. So because even I would but, I would probably say um, we're talking about two subtly different things. What you described cluster roles is not transparent multi cluster. That okay. is um, that's ex that's config management of cube clusters or maybe like we could we bring it up. Config management of use clusters is inherently a lower level version of a transparent multi cluster use case. If you have to know details of that cluster to build it, it's not transparent. So then what that's... about CRDs though? Like the, the idea that I can I can bring my own CRDs to a KCP server and then I have a set of unique controllers that can render those uh, the output of those uh, CRs, the instances from those CRDs. And maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something there, but if I if I bring my own custom resource, um, you know, maybe I can pick on Argo application set. Like Argo would probably target the control planes, the KCP instances. Like, I want to go deploy some stuff. Sure, here's the CRD for it. Okay, Argo says, hey, I want this to go. Argo at that point, location is a higher level concept. But like, if you want, if you want Argo to manage location, that's not transparent multi cluster. That's Argo the best it can do today. Sure. If you want location abstraction through Argo because you just want the GitOps part of Argo, not the, like the idea too of um, CD isn't built into, or the idea of like, um, it's almost like canaries or whatever. Like if you have a CD pipeline, you have to build that with, many people have to build that with multiple clusters. You should be able to build a CD pipeline inside a single logical cluster through transparent multi-cluster. Um, that would be a key net new capability but you would still be able to use GitOps or Argo and a CD pipeline completely ignoring, but you're not, that's not a transparent multi-use cluster use case. That's a, I probably just want to install the Argo agent on the underlying clusters, but then I don't. Right. I guess here, here's, here's the thing I'm trying to unwind in my head. When we talk about policy and we talk about the access uh, scope um, control, 
one of the things I'm trying to get my head around is that if KCP is somewhat focused on things like um, providing tenancy for CRDs, right? That, that, that makes perfect sense to me. The moment when a cluster might be uh, the, the final resting place for input to KCP logical cluster one and KCP logical cluster two, and if KCP logical cluster one has a different set of CRDs than two, then I, I don't understand how we would be able to render them down. And maybe the naive assumption that I'm making is that the CRDs installed in a logical cluster are being propagated and managed on cluster one. Yeah, they probably would one. not be generally. If and you so, have a CRD that you want all your clusters to support, then it is left as an exercise to the reader to spread those. And that's a different, that's a, that would be what I would call explicit multi-cluster configuration, which could be a different mode. Okay. Like you could, like um, the OCM model, like everything in the OCM model could fit within a single logical cluster work, logical cluster type that has a set of APIs. And you could say like everything that, everything that works in OCM today could just be controllers driving that, that you run an agent on those clusters and copy it down. But when you get to the point of, I have a workload that I want to spread across these two locations, the mental model shifts from I'm making these two locations to consi be consistent to they are expected to be consistent. And when they are not expect, when they are not consistent, something catches that and flags that as this isn't a suitable target. I'm going to bring everything off of it. So it's, it's the, okay. it, it's by splitting the ability to change you move to, a, it's like nodes, right? Like when I deploy a pod onto a node, I can't actually change the node. Mm -hmm. Like deploying a pod doesn't change the node or, or in practice it doesn't. So, so I would, I would, uh, I would summarize that or paraphrase that as if I had two unique tenants uh, that each had their own KCP logical cluster, they cannot share a set of clusters behind them unless there's an explicit assumption that all of those clusters have exactly the same set of types and configurations, right? And they, there, is an, there is an element of this, and this is probably the, <coughs> the factor to scheduling, which we haven't talked about in a while, which would be if you have, if you offer three clusters and only one of which can support that API, but you only asked for the workload to end up on that one cluster, it'll end up on that cluster. If that API is incompatible between the API version that you've said you wanted, that's an error that would prevent you from being placed on that. And then the fact that you can only go on one of the three is probably also an administrative error condition, or it's transient because you're upgrading that cluster, or somebody just blew up that cluster by accidentally uninstalling an operator for mm -hmm. big. Um, there probably should be back pressure against that sort of thing. But I don't think that's within the scope of the transparent multi-cluster use case. That would probably be a use case more like an OCM style use case, which is yeah. my job is to enforce consistency of clusters. When they drift, I will warn it. What is my back pressure to prevent upgrades from blowing up workload? Like think about a, a node, right? We have PDBs are back pressure from workloads to administrators that prevent the application from being disrupted. There's a missing yep. concept in Cube today, which is like total SLO disruption, mm -hmm. which would be um, an input to scheduling or drain, which is like when we drain something and we then immediately drain it, we've stopped instantaneous disruption, but we're accumulating a lot of service level disruption. Yep. I think about this very similarly, like there should be concepts in OCM like systems for cluster disruption that exhibit back pressure on rolling out updates to those yep. clusters that would impact the workloads on them. And I think as part of this, we should propose what the back pressure mechanisms are that defend logical clusters and transparent multi-cluster that are really orthogonal to that. It's, it'll, I mean, a cluster is a lot like a node. What's the thing that prevents you from upgrading too many nodes at the same time? Today, it's a mechanical switch on like something like an OpenShift upgrade or in GCP, you have a, a, a dial that how many nodes get updated at once. What's the back pressure mission? Yeah. Cluster? That's an OCM scope problem. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. That, that makes sense. And, and I think I, I would, again, kind of paraphrase that if you have multiple tenants sharing clusters, there is an assumption of consistency among them. 
in addition to if there is some reason why a workload can't be distributed or upgraded, um, we need a way to provide that feedback into KCP so that they know, hey, these clusters are available and not available for. And we really have to split CRDs into two types. What are the CRDs that are really part of the application? And what are the CRDs that are part of the infrastructure? Like persistent volumes, part of the infrastructure. You expect persistent volumes to work across clusters, but you might need something at the higher level that's like, does cluster A actually have permission to snapshot this persistent volume from another cluster? And the answer may be yes or no. That's a higher level concept. Whereas some things will be vague, like um, uh, in the short run, service mesh probably is both a high level and a low level. Uh, services, deployments, definitely both a high level and a low level. Etsy operator, probably the best operation, like Etsy operator, if you intend it to spread across clusters, might actually be better to have it at a higher level. Um, you know, anything. But Anything that you can make the problem is an application level, you get a benefit because now clusters are simpler. Because instead of deploying, instead of uh, polluting a bunch of clusters with, with lots of concepts, you have individual higher level systems that are designed for keeping concepts isolated and a system whereby you can say, oh, I want to roll out changes to this API. Like we will build it to KCP layer type things sets of APIs, um, which implementation of an API is bound to that? Connect that to the policy mechanisms that let us do controller list watches across tens of thousands of logical clusters. Be like, only the workloads that use this API have specified you as the implementation and have acknowledged that you have these permissions, you can yep. assume the role, will be allowed to list watch across it, which break like fixes the secret problem um or helps us address the secret problem is we really want those those integrations to feel first class in cube we're kind of just like yolo here's some roles and it's a good start the next step really is like oh i want to switch between two implementations across ten thousand logical clusters of the same api and roll out newfangled implementation one i need to have a marker that says which implementation everyone prefers what if that's a disruptive change so some of those yeah. And then we'll be able to use, I think down the road, I think of KCP as something that can run on a single cluster. And that's where application teams building most types of cube applications work. The number of workloads that really need host network or really need uh, root access to the host or really need, uh, those are a subset of all workloads. We want to crisp up that boundary between is your workload orthogonal to infrastructure or not? And if it's not, are you using an abstraction we provide to touch the node? And most of the cases where they're doing that today, it's an escape hatch around gaps and cube features. As we close those, you need less and less gaps. Like you need to host yeah. path less now that you have local volumes, local persistent volumes, for instance. That makes sense. And then if you um, if you did have a, a type that's specific to the application, something that hadn't been clear to me until this conversation, if I'm going to define a type like a Kafka topic, something that's not directly running in a uh, supporting cluster behind a logical cluster, then the controller that operates on that type in that KCP server is a controller that's running outside of the set of clusters that are managing the parts of the application that consume that. It, so and it, could be, it could be running as a pod, but it's talking to the control plane and that workload as is isolated from the other workloads. But then that leads to that leads up, you know, that leads operational teams things like they would need hub clusters or protected infrastructure mm -hmm. clusters where they could run controllers. Great. Now you have security zones for workloads, but you'd say, hey, all controllers for service integrations have to run in a level two security zone. Oh, this won't schedule under this cluster because it's not a level two security zone. Oh, I gotta go fix that. So like so part of that though different. means that the controllers, like you could think, you could think about the controllers that are reconciling the, uh, in this example, the Kafka topic, as controllers that themselves are just another workload for KCP running in some set of clusters behind the scenes, but they are actively reconciling the state of CRs that are in a specific KCP logical cluster, and if I wanted to scale it out, a single infrastructure focused oriented cluster in the background could be running controllers for multiple accounts of Kafka topics that are tied into different 
cloud accounting mechanisms that are completely different that are servicing the type and instance information from multiple disparate KCP servers. Yeah, it, it's even, so, and that, that's a really great example. I've been using that one. So today, imagine a CRD that goes and creates Confluent or MSK clusters and then brings back the credentials to access them and exposes them as secrets. That's like a level one uh, cloud operator. I don't know. Okay. Uh, the next level is imagine a controller that creates Kafka instances, but it doesn't care too much about what they are, and then adds a proxy layer or something that divvies up access to topics by telling Kafka to program its access control or by adding a proxy in front of Kafka instances. And that exposes a topic API. And both of those could be in two different sets of logical clusters side by side. No one would ever know. One of them has the Kafka topic API, or a lot of them have the Kafka topic APIs, and there's a controller. The controller is looking at Kafka instances, sharding it out. There's an analogy there for other types of systems. And then if someone down the road, like if um, Confluent offered a, a per topic creation API, then you could say, well, then just cut out the middleman and switch the implementation of my Kafka topic API from this to another provider. And the provider would be, you know, Confluent topic allocation. Uh, the API didn't change, the implementation did. So starting to think about ways that we can layer systems, which in a single cluster you can kind of do, but it's kind of pointless because you just keep shoving stuff into a single cluster until it blows up. We've got the hub cluster model where people are starting to explore that. I think then we take the lessons we've learned from the hub cluster and go up one level. We separate out control plane data plane, but we also let you say these chunks of APIs can be consumed by other controllers. So you might actually have like a multi-layered system, or at some point you're like, yeah, I'll just move this to a service off the cluster. Someone wrote a great integration. I don't even have to run that integration. You know, maybe you could imagine a, an, an operational team just saying, I'm going to boot a controller on a VM in my data center that reads from the Kafka, from a Kafka API exposed by Confluence Web UI and mm -hmm. programs a set of logical clusters. And the only people who have access to those credentials are the people who booted that VM. Um, so thinking about the ways that you start to divvy up trust meaningfully, um, I think is where we've got to be able to think about going because then that lets us do really hard boundaries between you know, um, you know, scheduling it when, when you only have one cluster, it's not going to add much thinking about like 10 or 15 clusters is where I think, you know, you start seeing some of the benefits, but then some of that infrastructure could be hosted or shared across, you know, hundreds or thousands of sets of clusters, which is where I think, you know, the end state of KCP, that's the other discussion, the sharding discussion, yeah. which we don't have time for. But. But having having the use case of multiple KCP logical clusters that are actually fronting a single large physical cluster is still a really powerful use case for development teams mm -hmm. for simplifying the service area. Especially, yeah, especially if you get some benefits you didn't have before. Like most things just work, and then later on you can add a second cluster and, and divvy up the workload. That's I think where it starts. Like. You want optionality, but the optionality has to be a net win for you. So trying to figure out what the net wins are to get you to trick you to be like, oh, I like the idea of this layer because I get better security for my workloads. Like app teams can't run host network. Like it's not even physically possible. They can't mount host volumes. All that stuff is stripped out. Like it is physically impossible to run an escalated privilege workload uh, because we pass it through. Okay. Um, yeah, and we thought we wouldn't have an agenda to fill the time today. Look at us. So um, oh. I want to ask uh, folks who've joined, um, we definitely have been kind of working through like, you know, broad topics, like meta topics here, and then doing a little bit more pragmatic collaboration in Slack or in uh, small groups. Um, are there folks here who wanted to bring up topics that we can put on for next time? Um, are folks mostly just interested in listening in? I mean, I know Joaquin, like you haven't, uh, you've been working on some of the prototype stuff for like load balancing across multiple clusters to fit into the prototype. Um, are there topics folks would like to bring up that we're not giving folks room to talk about? Well, uh, about the prototype on the KCP ingress, um, I was on PTO, but I was checking, you know, some some of the current implementations around 
global load balancers and, and open source stuff. And those multi-cluster solution usually have like a rigid architecture that you know makes it more complicated to integrate with what we are doing at KCP. As they, for example, try to reach the physical cluster directly and stuff like that. So as we discussed on, on another forums, uh, I will start working on, on a prototype. Um, so implementing those parts inside that KCP ingress prototype to actually use, I will try to create some interface, but I was thinking on using, uh, as, as we discussed, Cloudflare or, or other cloud providers. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to call time, and we will see you all next week. Um, I will hopefully be bringing a doc with more uh, summary of our thinking, hopefully, maybe hopefully. All right, have a good week, everybody. Thanks all. Thank you. See ya.